So a lot of people don't realize this, but conservation is not something new in zoos. Certainly today, it's much more pivotal and important because extinction, unfortunately, for some animals is imminent. Habitat loss is the biggest challenge uh, from my perspective. The reason that we have to deal with animals that are declining or rare or are, are extinct now is because of the loss of habitat. Reed Park Zoo is one small cog in the wheel, but I feel strongly if we can affect one person's behavior, it's worth it and it's something we need to do. I loved going to the zoo when I was a was a child, but some of my first memories are bears in in very barren cages, of, you know, a bowl of water and maybe a ball that they kind of rolled around. And, and I think there's, th those images are what zoos used to be. And I think when we're thinking about modern zoos, we're looking at really extending their range beyond just kind of entertainment for visitors coming in. Zoos have evolved over time quite substantially because they've begun to recognize that they need to create an environment that allows their captive animals to behave in more natural kinds of ways because a lot of these animals get bored in captivity. They would uh, self-mutilate, they would do a lot of excessive pacing. You get this appearance of abnormal behaviors and you know that's not how you want to present the animal. A lot of this happened around the turn of the last century, around 1900, where uh, they started to move from being private collections to being uh, something to teach people about uh, the biodiversity around the world. People wanted more realistic habitats. Uh, animal welfare became a big concern as we moved into the middle of the last century. And so when you look at modern zoos, they really are this balance between animal welfare and animal conservation and education. The Reed Park Zoo traces its roots back to a man named Gene Reed, and he was the director of Parks and Recreation for the city of Tucson. And he started collecting animals and put up some makeshift exhibits fencing cages in Reed Park. This was in 1965. And within a decade later, it was a full-fledged zoological park. And Reed Park Zoo has grown to become the number one ticketed attraction in Southern Arizona. The Reed Park Zoo has become much more involved in uh, research and supporting a number of different projects and exposing the visitors to the work that's going on in the field as well as within their collections. So the grizzly bears were wild animals that were kind of labeled problem bears and so um, they either needed to come into human care at a zoo or they needed um, to be euthanized was what was going to happen. So fortunately we had uh, habitat space open for them and a desire to help that and, and prevent them from being euthanized as well as educate our public about what it means to be bear safe and how we can help bears in the wild. Oftentimes when we think of animals held in zoos, we think about meeting all of their needs in terms of food and exercise and problem solving, but social needs are as or more important than many of those others. Elephants in particular spend their lives living in a family herd, so throughout their life they are with other elephants, and that is one of the key um, components of keeping a successful herd going. So in our new elephant habitat that was built in 2012, we have multiple spaces for our elephants. Our old habitat had essentially one habitat and then two barn stalls. Our newer facility, we have the ability to keep the herd together in one large space, or we can split the spaces up and do different social groupings. When we had um, our calf, we wanted her to have just time alone with her mom and then slowly introduce the other elephants to her. And so having that extra space really helps facilitate these kinds of um, different social groupings. I think that transformation uh, is something that you're going to continue to see happening as they uh, reach out to the conservation community and are involved in a number of different conservation efforts. Obviously, the way we present animals has changed a lot over the past 100 years. 
And today what we have is landscape immersion exhibitry, where the, the visitor actually feels that they are being transplanted to another place, immersed in the landscape and the habitat of the animals. The modern zoo has very natural habitats for not just the people walking through, but for the animals. We look at the welfare, we look at life cycles. If animals are active at nighttime, we're designing animal exhibits where they can have access to those areas at night. It's an important thing. The visitors enjoy it and obviously it creates a better quality of life for the animals. We are a fabrication company. We, we mainly do the construction. It starts essentially with the client wanting to create an exhibit. And then they go and they reach out to an architect and a designer. Their main role in it is to not only meet aesthetically what they want it to look like, but also how is it gonna work for the animal. They have to talk about its, its behavior, the size of the habitat from an elephant one versus like a monkey exhibit. You sit with the designer and then you actually start going over more of what we really want this to look like other than just scratches on a paper. You know, we actually start bringing in photos. We start having meetings with the client, trying to understand their vision behind it because we're really not producing something that we want to do. It's really about the client and the animal. Compared to 50 years ago, given all the improvements that zoos have made to make their habitats more natural, the animals are definitely happier, I would say. Now, of course, that's something that um, might be a little bit more difficult to prove. You know, how do you know if an animal is happy? So for each animal, it's different, but it's mostly looking at their behaviors. Elephants socialize a lot, wrap trunks with each other, touch each other a lot. So if we see that among the herd, we know that there um, is sort of peacefulness among the herd. The appearance of play and having the steady occurrence of play is a good yardstick. But then you can also rely on um, the judgments of keepers, the, the folks who know the animals really well. They develop often a close relationship with, with animals. They know the individuals uh, that they're in charge of. And they have a sense of their well-being, we would say, you know? And, uh, and that's trustworthy. My philosophy on conservation for zoos is, is a three-pronged approach. First and foremost, if you have a zoo, you should definitely fundraise to help animals in the wild, and that's usually by supporting conservation work. The second part of conservation is building capacity within a zoological park to breed animals and safeguard them, because the sad fact is that there's species like tigers, there's less than 3,500 tigers in the wild. There's more tigers in the zoos of the world than there are in the wild. If it comes down to a decision of having no tigers in the wild or having some tigers in zoos, I'd like to see some tigers in zoos. The third part of conservation is doing something to have our visitors understand how important conservation is and what they can do in their daily lives to make a difference for wildlife and wild places. Our conservation committee has been really revamping the process for what grants we fund over the past year. One of the flagship projects that we have really focused on is around the work of Dr. Charles Foley in Africa for elephants. The Terengiri um, Elephant Program uh, is where Dr. Foley and his team work um, a lot of their efforts are focused around preserving habitat in the wild. I, myself, my wife, and a team of, of people, we've been studying elephants in, in northern Tanzania for 25 years, specifically in a park called Tarangiri. So the big threat is poaching to elephants. And the reason that people poach is because they want the ivory. They want the ivory because they like the trinkets or it looks nice and they're prepared to pay money for it. We need to get the message out that the impact of buying on ivory, even legally, can mean that elephants get killed in Africa. And that is why the zoos are so important to this whole equation. These animals absolutely are the ambassadors for their species in the wild. We know that most children, uh, I myself haven't seen most of these animals out in the wild. To have the opportunity to see them um, and to fall in love with them. And it's so vitally important 
um, that not only do we provide the opportunity to interact, but that we teach how can you protect them in the wild. We have a number of programs that are geared towards different age groups. So we have kids as young as kinder and preschool all the way up to high school and college age. So regardless of age, we absolutely want people to connect to our animals, connect to nature, and understand why we do what we do. So not only how we do it, but also the reasoning behind having a zoo, learning more about them. That actually helps us in our mission to conserve and protect globally. It's just, I think what zoos do is so important. We have the opportunity to learn about animals in ways that researchers in the wild can't always. I think the, the interesting thing about public-private partnerships is what, what we can do is bring together entities that have two different missions that are complementary. There's never been a university on the planet um, that has a relationship with a zoo like the one we've got. Uh, and together we're able to do innovative things that neither party could do alone. It's really dual use of the same resources for both sides. Really, we work hand in hand with the zoo. I like to say that uh, you know, we wouldn't exist certainly without the zoo and the zoo wouldn't exist without the society. I would tell someone who doesn't believe in zoos that I have seen my own first-hand account species that have been saved from extinction by zoos and how zoos have worked with wildlife biologists to successfully reintroduce critically endangered species back into the wild. And zoos are going to be even more critical to species in the next decade and certainly in the next 50 years. We take our mission very seriously of conservation and the education programs and we also take animal welfare very seriously. If they are an opponent to zoo, they might look at a zoo in a different light. Everybody who visits the zoo, there's a way that when they go home, they can help to protect those species in the wild. And so it's equally important for us to teach people what those ways are that they can help. And Reed Park Zoo will never be done because the standards for animals constantly change. The latest technology and exhibits change. Certainly our husbandry changes. Conservation has challenges. There's always gonna be conservation challenges but we're gonna meet those challenges. We're not afraid of that. And so to me, the future is the zoo will always be growing. It'll always be adding new exhibits or new supporting different programs. And it's really, you know, it's limitless what we can do if we have the right community support. Everything starts with education. That's one of the things that zoos and aquariums can really help with. They get people engaged and interested early. It's what started me on my path to practicing conservation because I realized I really could make a difference. People care about elephants because they see them here at Reed Park Zoo. They also care about our tiny dart frogs. Every animal has a story to tell, and it's the job of our staff, our volunteers and docents, and everyone who supports this zoo, the whole community, to tell the story of those animals.